Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is September 24th, and today we're going to look at Numbers 32. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word. So today, Numbers 32. And then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so. So let's get to our reading now from Numbers 32. Now, Numbers 32 says this. Now the people of Reuben and the people of Gad had a very great number of livestock, and they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead. And behold, the place was a place for livestock. And so the people of Gad and the people of Reuben came and said to Moses and to Eliezer the priest and to the chiefs of the congregation, Ataroth, Debian, uh, Zazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elia, Seban, Nebo, Beon, the land that the Lord struck down before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. But Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord has given to them? Your fathers did this when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. And when they went up to the valley of Eshkul and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel from going into the land that the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled on that day, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. And I accept Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kezanai, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until all the generation had done evil, and the sight of the Lord was gone. And behold, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all this people." Then they came near to him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones, but we will take up arms ready to go before the people of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones shall live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until each of the people of Israel has gained his inheritance. For we will not inherit them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has come to us on this side of the Jordan to the east. And so Moses said to them, If you will do this, if you will take up arms to go before the Lord for the war, and for every armed man of you shall pass over the Jordan before the Lord, until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord. Then after that you shall return and be free of obligation to the Lord to Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep and do what you have promised. And the people of Gad and the people of Reuben said to Moses, Your servants will do as my Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our livestock, and all of our cattle shall remain there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will pass over every man who is armed for war before the Lord to battle as my Lord orders. 
And so Moses gave the command concerning them to Eliezer the priest and to Joshua the son of Nun and to the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel. And Moses said to them, At the people of Gad and the people of Reuben, every man who is armed to battle before the Lord will pass with you over the Jordan, and the land shall be subdued before you. Then you shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. However, if they will not pass over with you armed, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. And the people of Gad and the people of Reuben answered, What the Lord has said to your servants, we shall do. We will pass over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, and the possession of our inheritance shall remain with us beyond the Jordan. And Moses gave to them, to the people of Gad, and to the people of Reuben, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, the, the kingdom of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, the land and its cities with their territories, the cities of the land throughout the country. And the people of Gad built Deben, Atra, Aror, Eroth, Shopan, Jazer, Shobi, uh, Beth Nimrah, and Beth Haran, fortified cities and folds for sheep. The people of Reuben build Heshbon, Elia, Kirith, Aram, Nebo, Baal, Mimin. Their names were changed in Sibma, and they changed other names to the cities that they built. And the sons of Makor, the son of Manasseh, went up to Gilead and captured it, and dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. And Moses gave Gilead to Macher, the son of Manasseh, and he settled it. And Jair, the son of Manasseh, went and captured their villages and called them to Habath Jair. And Nobah went and captured Keneth and its villages and called it Nobah after its own name. Well, this is our reading today from Numbers 32. When did you last hear somebody complain about having too much money or too many possessions? If, you, if you're like me, that is not a thought that has occurred to you recently, unless perhaps you're moving and you're lamenting the fast mounds of possessions that had to be sorted, boxed, and even transported. In general, we are conditioned by our society to think that there's no such thing as having too much. And when it comes to even material things, we live in a culture in which more is most definitely not less, but indeed more. It is also true that our more is a good deal more than that of other cultures or times. In fact, most people throughout history have lived in tiny houses with only a few basic clothes and a few prized objects. Most people around the world continue to do so today. And yet we continue to add more and more to our catalog of possessions so that we require more and more space simply to store all the clothes that we're not wearing. If there is such a thing as the problem of having too much, our generation definitively suffers from it. Now, in this chapter of Numbers, we're going to see an ancient version of the problem of having too much. The Reubenites and the Gadites had accomplished a very large number of livestock, according to verse 1 of our chapter. They had acquired it perfectly, legitimately, through diligence and even hard work, and most recently through their share of the spoils that came from the holy war against the Midianites in Numbers 31. There was no sin per se in their having all of this stuff. However, having too much stuff placed a temptation in their path. As we're going to see in this chapter, a temptation to which were every bit as prone as they were. Now, the temptation that faced the Reubenites and the Gadites was to settle in a place dictated by their possessions, not by the Lord's promise. Now, in this chapter, these tribes came to Moses and asked for permission to settle down in the Transjordan region outside the promised land to Abraham by the Lord. And so what motivated their request? Well, you see, they saw that the area of Gilead was cattle country, and that made it desi a desirable home in their sight because they had abundant cattle in verse 4. Now, if they had only a few cattle, there would have been nothing to hold them there, a few short miles of the promised land proper. And so their possessions uh, chose their inheritance for them, not the word of God. Now, the key word in this first verse is the verb they saw. Seeing in the Bible is definitively not believing. On the contrary, sight is often the exact opposite of faith. Seeing is frequently the prelude to bad decisions because our eyes tend to make superficial judgment. Now, Eve saw that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and so she ate the forbidden fruit instead of believing the word of God that this fruit was not good, as Genesis 3, 6 says. 
The result was disaster for humanity. Later, when Lot saw that the plain of the Jordan was, you know, well watered like the garden of the Lord or like the land of Egypt, he chose to separate from Abraham and settle in the unpromised land to the east of the Jordan in Genesis 3.10. And so before long, he found himself living in Sodom and in danger of sharing in the judgment that was coming on that place in Genesis 19. So choosing with our own eyes, it often leads us into spiritually dangerous places, places that may seem may then be hard to leave because of our possessions. They weigh us down and hold us there. Wherever our possessions are, there our heart is also. And this was exactly what happened to the Reubenites and the Gadites. Their wealth of cattle combined with the grazing potential of the Transjordan plain prompted them to ask if they might just receive the area of the Transjordan that they were then occupying as their inheritance, rather than crossing the Jordan with the remainder of the people into the promised land proper. Now, to be sure, they made their request sound uh, super spiritual by even arguing that the Lord was the one who would have subdued this territory before his people. But it was ultimately economics that was driving their request, not theology. In effect, they were asking to settle down somewhere other than where the Lord had called them to live because it was more suitable for their lifestyle. And so the temptation today to choose with our eyes rather than by faith is one that we also face today. We are tempted to choose spouses based on looks rather than on Christian character or careers based on their economic uh, potential rather than the opportunity to use our gifts to serve our community. We're tempted to spend vast amounts of money on clothing, cars, and accessories of an affluent lifestyle instead of investing our treasure in heavenly causes. Our affluence constantly poses a temptation to us to settle down here and even invest ourselves in this world instead of settling our hearts on the things that are above. Now Moses responded to the requests of the Reubenites and even the Gadites with an uncompromising challenge. He called them a brood of sinful men in verse 14 of our chapter, and he diagnosed the sinful motivations that can lay concealed behind their plea. And in the first place, he challenged our selfish desire for comfort. Why should they sit comfortably in a place that had been conquered by the people as whole while their brothers went on to fight for the promised land of verse 6? This is surely a prime temptation of affluence. You see, the more we have, the more comfortable we could become with what we have and the harder it is to give it up for the sake of others. We become inwardly focused on maintaining our own personal standard of living and we easily lose sight of the need of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We become self-sufficient and we even become isolated from others. Isn't this true in the church around the world today? Those who have little are often extremely generous with the little that they have. I think of the tiny villages in Africa where people would sacrifice a great deal simply to serve you a can of mackerel with your soup or even to give you a pineapple. Meanwhile, we who have so much can can sometimes be very possessive in our abundance, finding it hard to share with others. The Reubenites and the Gadites were ready to sit Uh, thoughtlessly in their already won territory, watching from the sidelines where their brothers slogged their way through a lengthy campaign. Moses, however, uncovered their selfishness, and he's challenging it here. Second, Moses pointed out the likely impact of their desire to settle down outside the land on the rest of the Israelites. He reminded the Reubenites and the Gadites that their decision might well turn the hearts of the remainder of the Israelites away from the promised land of verse 7. After all, why should the rest of Israel battle the inhabitants of the land of Canaan for a foothold there if the Transjordan was just as good a place for them to settle? The half-heartedness of the Reubenites and the Gadites might become contagious and even lead to Israel's failing to follow through with the conquest. You see, such an outcome would inevitably have resulted in the Lord's judgment descending on the whole people just as it did in Numbers 14. It is in this same way with our self-centered affluence. The decision to settle down comfortably to enjoy what we have without any thought of God's call in our lives never simply affects ourselves. It affects our brothers and sisters 
leaders in the church as well. Every single one of us has a part to play in setting the spiritual temperature of our own congregation. If I am cool and even apathetic towards God, comfortably satisfied with what I already have, and that coolness, that apathy is going to dampen my neighbor's enthusiasm for God. Equally, if I am on fire for the Lord, passionately pursuing a life of holiness and service to God, then something of that heat will radiate out to those around me. We never live our lives in a vacuum. Our commitment or lack of a commitment affects the whole body in our local church. Third, though, by comparing the Reubenites and the Gadites to the reluctant scouts in Numbers 13, most identified the root sin that lay behind their proposal unbelief. What seemed to them to be a perfectly reasonable request was, in fact, turning their backs on what God had set before them in preference for something else. They would rather settle for comfort in the Transjordan than keeping on pressing on by faith into the difficulties of the promised land. Now, it's worth noting and even observing that this temptation, it confronts us uh, particularly strongly in times of affluence. You see, none of the Israelites wanted to settle down and even make their home in the howling wilderness. It was only when their earthly surroundings seemed uh, conducive to comfort that they were tempted to put down roots. It is the same for us today. When we find ourselves buffeted by the storms of life, we have little desire to settle down here on earth and live as if this were all there was. However, when life is good and earth's blessings are all around us, it's easy to fall prey to that temptation. So the root of our desire to settle down and even live for the blessing of the here and now, it's unbelief. Whenever we say in our hearts that life cannot get any better than this, we're despising and even rejecting God's promise of a life that is indeed better than the very best that this world has to offer. We have abandoned God's promise in favor of a second-rate alternative because we have stopped believing in the ultimate goodness of what God has offered to us. As C.S. Lewis put it, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot understand what is meant by the author of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased, Lewis says. You see, sight is content with the best that the world has to offer. And to put it in Lewis's terms, sight is happy with a better bucket of inner city mud than the one that our neighbors have been given. Faith, however, looks beyond the mud and the grim of this world to the far greater glory that God has promised us. Faith is therefore marked by a holy discontentment with this world, not merely when life is going badly, but even when life is at its very best. Faith eyes are always set onward, always looking beyond this world, always straining for a glimpse of the land of promise. Now Moses' statement that the attitude of the Reubenites and the Gadites was the same as that of their fathers in Numbers 13 and 14, that's ominous. Was Israel indeed to be plunged back into the wilderness for yet another 40 years? Fortunately, the answer is no here. This new generation was not like their fathers. The Reubenites and the Gadites responded to Moses' rebuke with a fresh initiative that met the desires of both sides. The Reubenites and the Gadites would build pens for their livestock and places for their women and children to live in the Transjordan so that they were not left exposed. But then they would send their best troops to go as the vanguard of the assault on the promised land, leading Israel into action from the front lines of verse 16 and 17 of our chapter. Now, it's important to hear the difference in tone that was present in their response. This was not merely a grudging acquiescence to Moses' rebuke on their part, but rather a complete change of heart. The Reubenites and the Gadites promised to hasten to equip themselves to lead Israel into the conflict in verse 17, to remain on the field of combat until every single one of the Israelites received their inheritance in verse 18. They thus took up the challenge to provide leadership for the community of faith in the ongoing struggle and to persevere in that struggle until every one of their brothers and sisters had received what God had promised. Like the U.S. military, they committed themselves to a no-man-left-behind policy. That in itself was an expression of their faith. For if the Lord did not grant his people the land he promised them, the Reubenites and the Gadites would be permanently committed to a life of war." 
And this is why Moses was able to accept the counteroffer of the Reubenites and the Gadites in committing themselves to the solidarity of the people of God and to the certainty of the Lord's inheritance. They had shown an underlying faith in the Lord that could survive living on other, the other side of the Jordan. And yet Moses also made the Reubenites and the Gadites swear formally they would indeed fulfill their promise to go with the Israelites warning them of the sure consequences of failure on their part. Failure to do what they had said they would do would be sin against the Lord, and then they would surely find out that such sin would find them out. It is easy to make a commitment to the right thing after hearing a stirring challenge to obedience. It is quite another thing, however, to maintain that commitment through a long and hard campaign. The Reubenites, even the Gadites, needed not only to begin well, but to finish well. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever promised the Lord you would do something for him and then slip back from following through in full obedience to him? We need to remember the, the strictures of Numbers 30 about faithfully fulfilling our vows to the Lord and follow through on the commitments that we've made. Now the Reubenites and the Gadites thus committed themselves publicly to do what they had offered to do, leading Israel into the conquest of Canaan and fighting a alongside their brothers throughout the campaign. And as a result, Moses granted them an inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River. In the former territory of Sihon, the king of the Ammonites, and Og, the king of Bashan, verse 33 of our chapter. They established their own cities there, marking their devotion to the Lord by renaming the existing cities that had pagan names, and thus claiming this to territory too for the Lord. And part of the tribe of Manasseh joined the Reubenites and the Gadites there, conquering additional territory to add to the Israel's inheritance of verse 39 through 42 of our chapter. This was a request that began in a belief was in the province of God used by the Lord to expand the borders of the Lord. Now in due time, the Reubenites and the Gadites did exactly what they had promised to do, leading Israel on its assault into the promised land. And they followed through faithfully on their commitment to stay with Israel throughout that struggle to the very end and were finally sent home with Joshua's blessing in Joshua 22. They thus received their desired home as an inheritance from the Lord where they were able to live with a clear conscience. And yet, at the same time, the dangers of which Moses warned in this chapter, it continued to haunt the Transjordian tribes. Immediately after they returned home in Joshua 22, they set up an altar near the Jordan River at the border between their territory and that of the Israelites. That simple act almost caused a war to break out between the two halves of Israel until the Reubenites and the Gadites clarified the fact that it was not a sacrificial altar, but was rather an altar to act as a witness to their share in the Lord. They had built it because they were afraid future generations would not remember if the tribes who lived east of the Jordan were part of Israel too. The risk of misunderstanding and miscommunication on this point was constantly present because of the land they had chosen to be their inheritance. There was always the threat that there would be a division within God's people due to the geographic divide provided by the Jordan River. That was the ongoing cost of the cattle-friendly land that they had chosen for themselves. As those who are easily tempted in our prosperity to settle for the good things of this world, how do we keep our eyes today fixed on the goal of heaven and our hearts longing with holy discontentment for the things that are above? Well, you see, the answer is to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ alone, whose own mission is the true antidote to the problem of having too much. Here was somebody who truly had everything, not just the very best that the earth had to offer, but the very riches of heaven itself belonged to the Lord by his own right. And yet far from settling down comfortably from what he had, ignoring the needs of his brothers as we're so prone to do, Jesus made himself one with those who were not by rights his brothers. He became one of us, humbling himself as a servant, choosing to live with the barest necessities of the world, hardly more than the clothes that he stood up in. Jesus traveled around for much of his life, unencumbered by possessions, simply seeking to do his Father's will. And what is even 
Furthermore, his father's will was that Jesus should lead the fight for our inheritance, taking the vanguard position in the assault on our spiritual enemy. That position would cost Jesus not only his comfort, but his life itself as he was nailed to the cross. But the result of the self-sacrifice is that our heavenly inheritance today is sure, won for us by his death. He has fought the good fight in our place so that we merely need to believe in him and follow in his footsteps and trust in his goodness in order to enter into his presence. His obedience is what earned our inheritance. His suffering paid for our sins. The passage also reminds us of a fundamental certainty of the universe when it says in verse 23, be sure that your sin will find you out. Sin is a tireless pursuer when it comes to seek its just payment. Like a shark that smells blood, it will never leave a wounded swimmer alone. It comes on relentlessly. It seeks its own wages, which are nothing less than eternal spiritual death. And yet the fact that it is all of of us who are in Christ, our sins will never find us out. You see, on the cross, every single one of those sins found Christ and they tore him apart physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That is why he hung there, abandoned, empty. All of our unbelief, all of our self-centeredness, all of our self-serving, all of our lust, all of our gossip, all of our lies, all of our pride, all of our grumbling, all of our sin descended on Jesus there on the cross and assaulted him on the cross, extracting the due penalty from him for our failures. And now because Jesus emptied himself to to the point of death on a cross, God has exalted him and has given him the name that is above every name in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. This is the reality that needs to fill our thoughts daily. The antidote to our fascination with this world's glories is simply to lift up our heads and to see the glories of Jesus. You see, we must look above to see our risen, exalted, enthroned king. How can we be enthralled with material things when we have contemplated the risen Christ? How can we be tempted to think that houses are cars or clothes or possessions are any more useful trinkets than when we have gazed upon the crucified lamb of god seated on his heavenly throne the cure for our unbelieving eyes is to look above and to see the king of kings and then to bow down and lay our lives in worship at his feet well i want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of reading the bible daily with dave my name is dave and today is september 24th and we've looked at numbers 32 until tomorrow may god bless you and keep you thank you for listening to today's episode of reading the bible daily with dave podcast if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts be sure to also like subscribe or follow servants of grace on facebook instagram x or youtube We appreciate your support.